Hello, thank you for tuning in. So I'm going to be reviewing two calls today that went out on the line on the 1st of October 2023. Forest Volkai and Pologia were hosting and I'm going to be covering Adam and Jack's calls. Just a quick comment on the pairing of Forest and Pologia. I didn't think it worked too well. Um, Forest spoke for maybe 90% of the time and Pologia only spoke for about 10% of the time. I think that a good pairing has got to be a lot more balanced, although I appreciate that when Matt's on, he tends to he tends to do the same. But um, in this case, I didn't really think it worked very well. But nevertheless, let's go and look at these two calls. So, yeah, Adam called in from, from the UK. And, um, yeah, he called in with the, uh, with the claim, effectively, that we're living in a some kind of computer simulation and that there's an intelligent mind behind it all. Um, obviously, apart from, I don't know, some fairly obscure scientific conjectures, he couldn't really support this uh, when he was. it was pointed out to him that it's fairly useless because it's not falsifiable, something which he admitted. He questioned really whether falsifiability should be a prerequisite for accepting this kind of claim. He then spent about five or ten minutes going over falsifiability and why it should not be a prerequisite. I must admit, I did get lost in terms of what he was saying. I was I was struggling to really make much sense of it. I don't know whether that was just me. Maybe I could have done with seeing his argument down on paper, but it didn't really um, it didn't really gel together what I did hear of it. And I know that eventually Adam got tired of it and wanted to move on. Sorry, not Adam. Forrest got tired of it and wanted to move on. But um, I did notice some good comments coming in the chat. And uh, one of the hosts, uh, oh, I forget what his name is, uh, something skeptic. Um, Eric, his name is, he made, a comment in, he made a comment in the super chat that falsifiable claims are useful and unfalsifiable claims are useless. Obviously, I agree with that. And um, I can also see that if you suddenly consider on falsifiable claims and models that you'll be in a situation where you would have to accept uh, countless numbers of these claims uh, which would all suddenly become viable simply because they can't be falsified and more dangerously and fatally I suppose, catastrophically you will be in a situation where uh, contradictory claims will become viable. For example, the claim um, an omni-god which is all good exists and an omni-god which is all bad exists. They can't both exist at the same time. So, yeah. Um, and I just thought that Forrest should have really just kept pushing back on what reason do we have to believe that this is actually true uh, in terms of there being an intelligent mind which is the originator of all things and we live in a simulation. Uh, presuming that's what he was saying, I think that's approximately what he was getting at. And he was also trying to support it near the end. This was a real red flag when he started talking about quantum physics. Uh, he mentioned some um, he mentioned some uh, aspects of quantum physics that I'm not familiar with. And I think that Forrest did exactly the right thing in terms of asking what are your credentials for physics and he said well he's got high school education. I can imagine if Matt was there he would have said well when you've got your degree and your postdoctorate, your, you know, your post postgraduate qualification and you're qualified to talk about quantum physics and we can be fairly confident that you understand it, then come back to us and then just put the phone down. Or alternatively, um, write down your evidence, the quantum physics as you understand it and how it leads, how you connect that to the existence of this intelligent mind which is the originator of all things. If you can do that, I have got somebody who's involved in high level physics research. I will bring it to them and I will ask them to confirm 
if you've represented quantum physics accurately and with good understanding. And once that's taken care of, then I'll get back in touch with you and we'll have you back on the show and we'll take it from there. And I can guarantee you, I can virtually guarantee that uh, Matt would never, you know, whoever or Forrest would never hear from this person ever again. Um, well, very unlikely that they would get in touch. But if they did, I mean, personally, I could find somebody who's quite high up in physics and ask them to have a look at it. And I dare say that they would go through it, possibly make red marks, make some comments. And then when this person comes back on the show, I say, right, OK, well, let's go through it. So, yeah, the uh, Higachi conjecture, uh, Tokyo, uh, 1987. Let's have a look. Well, according to such and such a person, professor at, you know, such and such university, you've got this problem and then start reading and then really get bogged down <clears throat> in it. And he wouldn't be able to respond unless he is of a similar level. So then I would say, okay, so go back to the drawing board, do your research, and then come back to me. I think there's always a way of dealing with these people who are getting into high level, you know, imagine that somehow they're getting into high level science. And yet, if you took an undergraduate physics book and opened at a page, or maybe Feynman or something like that, and you opened at one of his pages, which has got equations on it, and said, right, okay, well, this is a uh, first year undergraduate BSc physics. Uh, explain this to me. What does this, do you recognize this uh, equation? Uh, what does it demonstrate? Uh, and you know, I mean, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> it's just so laughable that people come in with quantum physics and they can barely even solve simultaneous equations. It's just embarrassing. Okay, so yeah, so, oh yes, and then of course Adam at the end of the call made this incredible claim that he's a microbiologist and he's got a doctorate in microbiology. Well, that's really strange. I'm surprised he didn't say anything before when he was saying that he only had um, high school education in physics. I'm really surprised he didn't say, well, I've got high education, high, high school education in physics and philosophy, uh, but actually um, uh, I'm a doctor, you know, in uh, microbiology. And actually, if I was Forrest, then I would have said, okay, you're, you say you're a doctorate in microbiology. You're a genuine academic with credentials. Which institution are you attached to? Where did you do your doctorate? And who was your supervisor? And what's your name as well? Because if you're an academic, you should have no fear of revealing who you are. You just shouldn't. And I would have called his bluff out on that one. I very much doubt whether this person is a real microbiologist. And if anybody did have a PhD in microbiology, they wouldn't be phoning a, a, an atheist call-in show to demonstrate their ignorance on quantum physics. I thought it was laughable. I thought they could have called them out a bit more on that, but okay, moving on to the other one. So Jack, yeah, calling in, really trying to switch the burden of proof, saying that why can't we trust the sense experience and the religious experience of people that we know, people that we trust? Why isn't that enough? And I thought that Forrest and Pologia gave perfectly reasonable answers on that, that um, it can only be evidence, if it's evidence at all, for the person that's having the experience. Because, you know, there's the experience itself and then there's the interpretation. And if the interpretation points to something supernatural for which we've got no confirmation, then it's difficult to know how the person who's had the experience could justifiably reach that uh, conclusion. But it certainly couldn't be justifiable for the person who hasn't had the experience and just simply has a good friend. And I think Forrest, I think it was, who gave his example of his mother. His mother has claimed certain things. He trusts her, etc., and she wouldn't lie to him. And yet he doesn't believe her claims. So unfortunately, when Jack went off, he made this amazing claim, which he straw manned effectively and invalidated the last 10 minutes of the conversation because he suddenly said, what did he say? He said that he couldn't wrap his head around this idea that sense experience is unreliable. Well, nobody's saying that. Nobody is saying, and Forrest certainly didn't say, that all sense experience is unreliable. It depends upon the kind of experience and it depends upon the interpretation and what that's pointing to of the experience. For example, um, 
I'm having an experience now by touching this computer mouse. I can see the computer mouse. I can feel it. I can touch it. So I've got my sense experience of the computer mouse, the touch and uh, the sight of it. Yeah. And I've got my interpretation of that sense data. My interpretation is it's a real tangible computer mouse in the real world. It's not an illusion. It is actually real. So my sense data maps to something which is real in the real tangible world. And I think I could be confident and that that is a reliable sense experience. It's not 100% reliable. It's not certainty, but it's a very, very high level of reliability. Contrast that with standing in um, an evangelical church, a happy clappy church singing Rock of Ages, and everybody around you has got blissed out looks on their faces and they're looking at you with love and uh, you know your spirits are soaring, you're full of joy, you're full of love, you feel this uh, euphoria in your body and you think oh my god. So there's the there's the sense experience, the the feelings of euphoria, the joy etc. That's the experience. What does it map to? What interpretation are you going to put on that sense experience? So your interpretation is, well, it's the Holy Spirit. OK, well, this is where we've got problems. And this is where we've got to say that it's not the sense experience which is unreliable. It's your interpretation. So we believe you that you had this experience. We accept your description of the experience. What we don't accept is your interpretation because it's never been demonstrated that any such thing as the Holy Spirit exists. It's a supernatural concept and there's no evidence for it. And you can't demonstrate any connection between your sense experience and this thing which just seems to be a concept or an idea and which does not seem to map in reality in any in any kind of way. So this is where your sense experience is reliable, but your interpretation is at fault. And I just think that Forrest could have been a bit more explicit about that because he spent 10 minutes going through uh, talking about it, but somehow he didn't get through to him. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made this straw man comment that he can't wrap his head around uh, sense, uh, the sense is not being reliable. And that's a straw man. It's not true. Nobody's saying that that all sense all sense experiences are unreliable. The sense experience can be reliable and uh, usually is reliable. What's not reliable is either your interpretation of it. It, it may not be reliable. It depends on what the claim is. If your interpretation points to the supernatural, then it's probably not reliable. If it points to a mundane everyday thing like a computer mouse, then it probably is reliable. So yeah, he straw manned him there and he got away with it and he went away feeling that, you know, um, he's justified because Forrest's position that all sense experience is unreliable is not viable. So, okay, I thought that was a bit of a fail. Maybe you disagree. Okay, well, that's about it. Uh, let me know. Did you hear those calls? Tell me what you thought of them, whether you think that my take on them is fair or not. Okay, bye for now.